Okay, so today I'm here with Dr. Christian, um, and we're interviewing him, kind of learning about what he's done so far, and kind of, um, we're doing a little bit of a different series. He's actually going to be the first of his series that uh, I haven't figured out a name yet, um, but I think we're going to interview people that um, have different very specialized practices, uh, kind of a niche. Um, and so we're gonna start off with Dr. Christian. Um, and to give you guys a little background on him, and this is all stuff that I found online, and so he's gonna elaborate a little bit more. Um, he has a practice in Brea uh, called Customized Vision Care. Um, and it specializes in peds, binocular vision, sports vision, vision therapy, computer-related symptoms, um, strabismus, uh, uh, amblyopia, and contact lens fitting. Um, and on his schooling, he went to UCLA for undergrad, go Bruins, um, and uh, he did his optometry degree in Berkeley, UC Berkeley, and also got a PhD in um, physiolog is it physiological, physiological optics, optics in, uh, also from Berkeley. Um, and he I just fi uh, found out that he actually retired from um, Jules uh, Sinai uh, and um, also has been a professor at SCCO. And he does a lot of sports vision, and I think this is where the meat is going to be. Um, and he's done for he's done it for a lot of teams like the Dodgers, uh, Kings, Red Sox, Celtics. I have like a list of uh, teams that he's done, and uh, also probably has a lot more. Um, and then he's done extensive lectures all throughout America and also abroad, right? Um, mm -hmm. And then um, also I noticed that I uh, was previously on the board of directors for Vision West. Um, and he has, I mean, talk about research and publications. I couldn't even count the number of research and articles uh, that he's uh, done in the past. So very, very smart uh, guy. Um, <laughs> and uh, a lot of community <laughs> service, which is obviously very important and near and dear to my heart. Um, and also, sounds like um, sports vision consultant is, uh, to be honest, I didn't really kind of understand what that was, so I'm definitely going to want to find out with you guys. Um, so does that kind of sum up everything? In the I'd area? like to meet that guy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he sounds really good on paper, right? And it just, if you hear about all the stuff that you've done so far, it's just uh, very, uh, you know, uh, mind-blowing. Thank you. So. Um, so can you tell me a little bit about how you started uh, this Brea practice? It was kind of an interesting um, method of starting a practice. Uh, it was called a shared overhead arrangement. There was a uh, uh, OD in practice, mm -hmm. uh, Richard Blake, and he had an extra exam room, he, uh, which he really wasn't using uh, to its fullest extent. And he made me an offer, which I couldn't refuse. And that was, he said, you come in here and you've got full staff, you've got full frames, you've got full contact lenses, everything's provided for you, and you can start your practice within my practice and just pay me a percentage of what you bill, mm -hmm. and we'll let it grow. Mm -hmm. And so I started my private practice with zero dollars, mm -hmm. uh, because everything was provided. Mm -hmm. The only thing that I put in was actually my own phone line, so that when my patients called, they called on my phone line, they were my patients. Mm -hmm. And if they called on his phone line, they were his patients. Mm -hmm. And we had a separate arrangement for uh, if I saw office patients, then I shared in that uh, revenue. Uh, but he could not see my patients, mainly mm -hmm. because they were specialized and he didn't practice that brand of optometry. Mm -hmm. And that went on actually successfully for seven years. Mm -hmm. And at which point he came to me and said, well, you know, we should really merge the two practices because that's what the goal was at the beginning. And I said to myself, I really don't want another, a partner, so I bought his practice. And then he worked for me for another three years after that, mm -hmm. and then he eventually gave up uh, practice. Mm -hmm. But the interesting thing was is when I had my own practice, uh, all the patients thought that I worked for Dr. Blake. And the transition was so seamless that after I bought his practice and he worked for me, the patients still thought that I worked for him, <laughs> as did the staff. Uh -huh. <laughs> and so it, it really worked out uh, quite well. It allowed me to um, 
uh, start a practice without the huge amount of uh, overhead which you would have to pay if you open cold right. and you know cost you eight thousand dollars a month and you, know, you haven't had a patient walk in the front door yet so it was a, uh, a very valuable opportunity to be able to start my practice uh, in, the, in that way. So did you have to share in the cost of the rent and utilities or was it all set from percentage? It was always it was all set from the percentage of the amount of money that I uh, that I billed. Okay and how soon after you graduated from school did you uh, start that? Uh, probably four years because I finished my PhD in 77 mm -hmm. and then I was full-time faculty at uh, SCCO until I believe 82 and that's when I started my private practice and that's when also I became associated with Joel Stein. Mm -hmm. okay. So I worked all three jobs. Wow, busy man. <laughs> yeah. Um, and how, many, how, many, how much time uh, before you started seeing a good stream of uh, patients when you felt like, oh, I've got this? Uh, I would say between probably six months to a year. Oh, that's pretty cool. I, I, I tell students, uh, and they're very amused when I tell that, I said for the first six months I was in practice, I kept my appointment book in my head because there was no sense writing anything down. There just wasn't that much. And you can never lie to patients. So a patient would call up and say, can I see you on Thursday? And I said, absolutely. I just had a cancellation, which was absolutely true. But what I canceled was my tennis game. And then I came in and I would yeah. see the patients. And then as time went on, it became a little bit more regular. All right. Okay, that's good. Um, so when you purchased a practice from Dr. Blake, um, did you have to take out a loan or did you have enough income to kind of, how did that arrangement go? We, uh, we organized it so that there was a payout. So okay. I was able to uh, pay Dr. Blake uh, what I owed him over time out of that's current great. income. Okay. So I didn't need to uh, take out a loan to be able to do that. Wow, that's, I mean, that's the way to do it. You had really low risk from the beginning. Yes. Um, I think the average now to even open a practice or to buy a practice, it's at least 250000 just for, you know, the basic and it's not, but you had no risk really and that's really smart. I wish that was common. But. Well, one, of the, one of the beauties of being able to start the, uh, the practice that way is that you don't have the initial overhead. Right. And because you don't have the overhead, um, usually when you're in a, an employee-employer relationship, the older doctor gets very um, annoyed when you sit there and read the newspaper mm. because you have, you know, there's no patience for you to see at a given time. And in this situation, Dr. Blake really didn't care whether I saw patients or not right. because if I saw patients, he benefited. And if I didn't see patients, it didn't cost him anything. Right. So the older doctor was not having to pay the younger doctor. Yeah. So there was more risk on my part because if I didn't see patients, I didn't eat. Right. So it was a real impetus for me to see the patients, but it wasn't a drain for Dr. Blake. So mm -hmm. it was really a win-win situation. How did you um, gather your patients? What kind of marketing did you do? Um, I really didn't do very much external marketing. The two biggest things, I think, I was very active in my temple. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's something in Judaism called the Bar Bat Mitzvah, and you were about 13 years old. And mm -hmm. I got connected with one of those students, mm -hmm. uh, a lady who wanted to be fitted with contact lenses. And that was how the whole thing started because then everybody in the class wanted contact lenses and they yeah. said, well, where did you get them? And all of a sudden it increased. And I also screened 2,000 kids a year myself, not in the public school system. I went around to all the preschools oh uh, in the area within a 10 mile radius. Wow. And talked to the directors yeah. and said, what are you doing for your kid's vision here? And they looked at me like I had two heads and they said, what did you mean? So I used a lot of the AOA materials for um, children's vision and we set up screenings mm -hmm. and I did those screenings and I developed a letter which would not tick off any OD or MD if they already provided eye care for the family. I just illustrated what what was wrong during the screening and recommended that they get their eyes checked 
and it, of course, the letter went out on my letterhead stationery, and the AOA brochure was stamped with my office information. So when the parent got the letter, they said, well, we really don't have anybody that sees kids, and they have a piece of paper in front of it with my name and office number on it. So it really grew from, uh, from that. At one point, 70% of my patients were under the age of five. Oh, wow. So wow. that's, uh, that's really how it, uh, how it grew, because I'm now seeing the kids of the kids I used to see. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, and they usually will bring their parents, and then the parents don't want to exactly. stay with Exactly. Yeah, them. usually yeah. kids don't drive, so they come, <laughs> they come with a parent, and they usually come with siblings. Mm -hmm. And so if you do a good job and you make the uh, patients feel welcome in the office, then they'll, um, uh, you get not only the child from the screening, but you get the sibling, and you get the parents, and potentially the grandparents. Did you always know that you wanted to focus on uh, peds or sports vision, or is that something that got handed to you? I was a binocular vision person, um, and it, when you deal in binocular vision, you're kind of automatically relegated to the pediatric world. Uh, when I graduated, there was no such thing as residencies, so I didn't have an opportunity uh, to do that. But because I was a binocular vision person, mm -hmm. I ended up seeing a lot of kids. Mm -hmm. uh, sports vision was not on the radar. That was a purely serendipitous occurrence. Okay, we'll get into that. That's the whole okay. other, that's the meat that I was talking about. <laughs> Very excited to hear about that. Tell me about how you got involved. So, so you did, SCCO before getting into this practice. So how did you get into becoming a full-time faculty member at SCCO, which is now called uh, Marshall B. Ketchum? Um, university. Yeah, university. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when, I, when I was finishing my uh, PhD, um, you kind of go on the job market and their various institutions will contact you about a faculty position. And uh, Richard Hopping, who was the uh, dean mm -hmm. at the College of Optometry at yeah. that time, uh, recruited me to come to Southern California because they needed a uh, binocular vision person in basic science. And my wife was from Los Angeles, so that was uh, handy. She was very excited about doing that. Uh, so we moved to, uh, to Fullerton. Mm -hmm. And I spent six years um, full-time at uh, SCCO. Uh, in binocular vision, and then I decided to start a private practice at that point, mm -hmm. and so I went part-time at the College of Optometry, still teaching the basic, so basic course in binocular vision, mm -hmm. and teaching all the labs, and that, they did, uh, they did a schedule change that allowed me to do that all day Monday and all day Tuesday. I had four hours of a lecture and 12 hours of lab, uh, which they put into, uh, into two days. Mm -hmm. And then I worked in my practice the rest of the week. Okay. And then I was invited to come to Jules Stein uh, Eye Institute at UCLA mm -hmm. in the Department of Ophthalmology and Pediatric Ophthalmology and did some lecturing and some research and some, and that kind of evolved into clinical care there as well. So I had a clinic at Jewel Stein for specialty binocular vision work. Um, so you, did you start that clinic um, for the? I was the, fr I was the second OD at Jewel Stein. Barry Weissman was the first in contact lenses. Uh, and I was the second uh, OD PhD to be at Jewel Stein. Mm -hmm. um, they had, uh, a few working as effectively technicians for ophthalmology to help work up patients and so on, but uh, I was the second one that actually had um, my own clinic mm -hmm. and would see specialty patients. Is it still running um, now? That's an excellent question. Um, they said they were going to uh, look for a replacement, um, and I have offered to help train them and so on, but so far nothing has come of that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so to be determined. To be determined. <laughs> All right, um, so this is the part that gets very interesting uh, to me too, um, the sports vision part. So, um, so tell me how you got involved in sport vi uh, sports vision. Well, I said, as I said, it was really kind of an accident. I was uh, treating the wife of the team physician of the Dodgers um, at UCLA. 
and we put the drops in and we're waiting for the drops to work at that part of the exam and so I'm sitting having idle conversation with this uh, the team physician for the Dodgers and I simply said well I wonder whether there's anything visually uh, unique about these elite, elite um, baseball players and he said I don't know why don't we test it I said, well, what do you mean? He says, well, bring all your stuff down to spring training. We'll run all the guys through and we'll see whether there's something there. Mm -hmm. And that's how it started. Was there something there? Oh, yes, there was something there. It was rather embarrassing the first year because, as you know, um, most uh, visual acuity charts go down to 2020. And if you get a really good one, it goes down to 2015. Mm -hmm. So we tested all the players there on a standard visual acuity system. And the data was really quite amazing. There were four people that didn't max the chart. So we said something's wrong here mm -hmm. that uh, maybe they have better vision than we think they do. Uh -huh. So um, in preparation for doing that the next year, as you know, since visual acuity is an angular uh, measurement, all we did was double the distance so that everything that was 2020 was now 2010 and everything that was 2015 was you know, 27 and a half. Mm -hmm. And the resolution of the human eye is supposed to be 20 over 8. Mm -hmm. So when we tested the players, then we found a distribution. And that was the first article that we published in um, 1996 in the uh, Journal of Ophthalmology uh, in that the average professional baseball player has 2012. My partner of 28 years, Daniel Labby, who's a pediatric ophthalmologist, was in Boston. Now he's in New York uh, doing purely sports vision. Uh, he was a fellow at Jules Stein Eye Institute. He, so he was a student of mine mm -hmm. when uh, he was at Jules Stein. And he was the one who effectively took the data that we generated and uh, uh, we published the uh, first paper in mm -hmm. 1996. That's cool because yeah. we refer to that a lot. So whenever, there was um, a little spar uh, part for the sports vision. And so there's a lot of, I think, now that I think about it, I think that's why your name also sounds really familiar because there's a lot of references to you and uh, facts. So that's yeah. 2012. Well, rings a bell. Um, my, uh, Dan Labby and I decided uh, early on that we were not going to embrace any ideas or technology that was not published in the peer-reviewed medical literature. Mm -hmm. Because in sports vision there was a lot of hearsay and, and uh, just you know um, anecdotal information. Right. And so we would, see people say, well, if you just stand on your left foot and you bounce up and down and you hold the bat like this, then you'll bet 400. And you'd say, well, well how do you know that? He said, well, the last person I did it on it worked. Mm -hmm. And that was about the level of research there was in sports vision way back in 1992. And so when we published that first article, um, and from then on, everything that we've done in sports vision has been published. Mm. So everybody has uh, yeah. advantage of taking a look at that yeah. and incorporating it however they uh, they want to. Yeah, well, thank you for all that research. I mean, a lot of people yeah. don't like doing research, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it was a, it's a, bur a, a burgeoning field, yeah. and uh, therefore we felt that we had to kind of move it along a little bit and add some science to the, uh, to the idea of is there something having right. to do with these elite athletes. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that's... 2012, I mean, yeah, we, now we have it in our um, computerized VA, so you can go all the way down, I think, to 28, maybe that's the one, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, that's pretty But tiny. from a science perspective, you have to go below 20 over 8 because you want to make sure you're not getting a floor effect. Mm. In other words, oh. I, I have to present targets that nobody can see, Oh. right, because mm -hmm. then you know that you've, you've captured the truth threshold. Mm. What was the best uh, VAs that you've ever... About 2.8% of the major league population has 20 over 8. That's really scary That's really vision. Small. It's yeah. really scary. <laughs> but it's not, the, it, it's not a what's called a monotonic relationship. It's not how well you perform in sports as a function right. of what your vision is. So the 2020 people perform at this level, but the 2015 people perform at that level. It's not, it's not, that, uh, it's not that easy. You have to kind of think of it as a visual package, like they have um, acuity is nothing more than a, a size measure, but they mm -hmm. have to have contrast, that they have to have processing time, uh, and all of those things need to be at a certain level. And once you exceed that level, it doesn't doesn't help much. 
mm. but you have to obtain the minimum. Right. And you have to have it in all the areas to be able to perform optimally. So that kind of leads me to the next question. So um, what do you do for uh, the sports team? Uh, you mentioned that you do the comprehensive eye exams, obviously, but what's the extra? Well, let me uh, correct that. I, I could understand how you could have that slight misperception. We do not provide comprehensive eye exams for the players. Mm. Uh, we're a performance-based um, testing. We don't do any medical eye care at all. We let them go to their local OD or MD and use their insurance mm -hmm. and say, get your medical eye exam. This is a performance vision examination. Mm -hmm. so, and we've honed this down to what visual skills do you need for the best offensive performance. Mm -hmm. So we, we've been doing this for so long, we have a profile of a major league athlete um, and we have several testings that we do. One is a uh, an iPad test that we use that tests, well, let me back up a little bit. If you think of a standard eye uh, chart, mm -hmm. it's black and white, high contrast, and unlimited viewing time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There is nothing in this world, certainly not in the sports world, that's black and white, high contrast, and unlimited viewing time, which means what we're testing in the normal exam room mm -hmm. is unrelated to how they perform on the field. Yeah. And therefore, we had to do something different. So it turns out that you can test acuity in a standard way, you can test contrast, and you can test processing time individually. But we found that if we do that simultaneously, that there's interactions between them, and that's really what vision uh, performance is all about, is taking those three major components into, a, into account, mm -hmm. both the, the size that you can see, what's the contrast, what's the lowest contrast you can see, and how fast can you process that visual information. Mm. And so this uh, iPad test that we have uh, presents targets to the patients that have all three of those components simultaneously. Wow. And the analysis uh, is done by what's called a, um, I just drew a blank on the name, it's the same one they use for the um, uh, SAT, uh, tests. It's called uh, factor analysis. It's not factor analysis. Item response theory is what it's called. Item oh. response theory. And from that, you end up with a single number that is related to their performance. And therefore, you can, given that number, you can um, rank the players and give that ranking to the team. Mm. So they know that one player is better than the other. And then the Software is so powerful that you can ask the question, why did you get that number? Was it a size problem, a contrast problem, or a speed problem? Mm -hmm. And so it takes apart that one number, and then you can analyze where, in fact, your intervention needs to be. Oh, yeah. So the interesting is that for some reason, vision training and sports vision have been kind of joined at the hip for a long time. Right. And we have spent 20 years trying to break that link mm -hmm. because they're not necessarily related. I would say that 80% of all the work that you can do in sports vision is done in your exam lane. Mm. Okay? Mm -hmm. And that's a misperception that people have. That I, I'm not going to do sports vision because I don't do VT. I don't do eye exercises. And it turns out very little is necessary. So let me give you an example of what I mean. Let's take a common thing to, uh, to, to treat in vision training is accommodation, mm -hmm. okay? So if you know something about baseball, the, it takes about 400 milliseconds for the ball to make it from the pitcher's hand to the catcher's mitt. Mm -hmm. 400 milliseconds, that's it. Well, if you begin subtracting a certain amount of information from that, so it takes about 150 milliseconds to swing a bat. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it takes about probably 25 to 30 milliseconds to decide what you're, whether you're gonna swing or not. Mm -hmm. And then it, it just, you keep walking backwards. And by the time you walk backwards with all of those things out of the 400 milliseconds, if you don't start your swing when the ball is within 10 feet of the pitcher's hand, you'll never get the bat around fast enough. Which also means that the players have about 100 milliseconds 
to get the spin, the trajectory, and the velocity and decide where that, if that ball is going to be over in the strike zone or not. Mm. That's it. A hundred milliseconds. So now given that information, let's talk about the accommodative system. So you have an accommodative target and it moves from one distance to another and therefore you have to accommodate, all right? Mm -hmm. The latency of the accommodative system is 400 milliseconds, which mm -hmm. means when you decide to accommodate, yeah. the catcher has the ball. Yeah. So why bother training accommodation in a baseball player? It's worthless. You can't use accommodation for anything in baseball having to do with, with hitting, okay? Mm -hmm. Same thing with the virgin system. What's the latency of the virgin system? I'm gonna track this baseball as it's coming closer to me, okay? The latency of the virgin system is about 400 milliseconds also. Mm -hmm. So therefore, and we have high-speed video indicating at the point of impact, you're focused about two to three meters in front of the plate. Mm -hmm. So you can't track a baseball that's going too fast. Right. It exceeds the, the angular velocity ability in the eye. So therefore, why bother to train all that stuff? Because it's actually not useful in offensive performance. So what kind of stuff do you train? We, um, well, we do, the biggest thing we can do is change the mindset of a refraction. Because that turns out to be critical when you start talking about visual acuities of 2012 or 2010 or 20 over 8. So as I said, many acuity charts go down to 2020. If they go to 2015, that's fine. And many practitioners will refract to 2020. They'll say, oh, you're doing terrific. You got 2020 vision, and that's what they'll prescribe. When in fact, the visual system is capable of, in some people, more than that. So the mindset is keep refracting until you've optimized their visual acuity. Be that 2015, be that 2012, 2010, or even better than that. So get the equipment necessary to have those sorts of targets in your exam room and keep refracting until you optimize their vision. Don't stop at some arbitrary level. Okay. And therefore provide those ophthalmic equipment, uh, glasses, contact lenses, that allow them that kind of vision mm. because that's what they're gonna need for their offensive performance. So you need toric uh, contact lenses that are very stable. Yeah. And you can't have them blink each time and have the axis of the astigmatism change each time. And the concept of hitting glasses, that they may, not, they may have 2015 vision normally, but they may have 2010 vision if you correct them. Mm -hmm. and, but they don't need 2010 vision to play in the field in defense. So the concept of hitting glasses, you come up and you put on a different uh, helmet when you go to bat, you put on your ring around your ankle, um, and it, you put on your uh, gloves. Uh, well, you also put on your hitting glasses, mm -hmm. which gives you that very finely tuned acuity when, in fact, you need it. Do you guys use us? Uh, do you use prescribed special lenses for them? Is yeah, good ones. Good too. <laughs> <laughs> and you also sometimes have to displace the poles of the lenses. Okay. Because when they have their head yeah, in right. this sort of position, you have to displace the pole so they're looking through the optically pure part of the lens hmm. when, they, uh, when they're batting. Is it Conti usually curved? Well, you, it turns out that you get a lot of peripheral distortion if they're highly curved, so you want as little curve as possible, but okay. you, have to, you have to get some. And it has to be a, a frame that's approved for on-field performance from a safety perspective, because you can do real damage if you get hit by a... Uh, baseball. Mm. So you have to make sure that the eyewear that you prescribe uh, meets the standards that are necessary for on-field play. Sorry, I cut you off when you were going to talk about contact lenses. Well, you just need contact lenses that uh, predictably have excellent optics, uh, that they have UV protection because those players spend a lot of time outside, and that if they fit them in a toric, it has to be very stable. So it, it's interesting that the, the um, and we, might, we use almost all one-day contact lenses. So you put them on, you wear them, you take them off and throw them away, so you get a brand new sterile lens every time you put them on. Okay. And you, uh, any of your, what's your go-to lens for contact lenses? My go-to lens is the um, uh, one-day AccuView. Okay. The, both the in Moist the, or the Oasis? Um, or? 
I have the oasis, the oasis if we can, and the moist if the axis of the astigmatism, because they have a greater uh, variety of axes uh, on the moist. Okay. So that's, that's my go-to lens. Um, the most common ophthalmic prescription that I write in spring training is plus a quarter minus a half at 137. And most people would look at that prescription and say, yeah. why bother? I mean, that, that would be nothing. Uh -huh. But if you show that in a trial frame to an athlete, they'll go from oh. 2012 to 2010. Wow. And therefore, you have a dilemma. What do you fit them with at plus a quarter minus a half? Mm -hmm. Okay. And the question is, do you do equivalent sphere and give them minus <laughs> a half yeah. and hope? Uh -huh. Okay. It turns out that of those two, the astigmatism prescription is the more important. So when in doubt, correct their astigmatism. Makes a mm. big difference. Mm. That's really interesting. That's a that's a small prescription. Very. Yeah. Oh. Do you ever do ortho? Would you recommend ortho K to these players, or is it too much it, of a hassle? Or? Well, it doesn't give you nearly the vision okay. that uh, contact lenses or glasses would give you, and there's some potential, I don't like pushing normal cells around on the front of the eye. Yeah. Um, and for all of the, um, with these players, um, I would love to fit many of them with RGPs because you, they would have excellent vision. You could, it masks the astigmatism. I think it would be terrific. Unless you have instant comfort, they just won't wear them. Mm. They, they won't put those lenses on yeah. and you tell them this will be much better for you, just get, get over the hump, they talk to me in 30 days, you give them the whole speech <laughs> and you put it on and they just uh, they won't tolerate the lenses yeah. unless they have instant comfort and instant vision. Yeah, even with those like plus, especially those plus quarter minus 15s. <laughs> exactly, yeah. exactly. I would, I would love it if they would, if they yeah. would wear those but uh, yeah. they haven't had any I success mean, doing that. I couldn't that. even wear them during school. I, yeah, it's very uncomfortable. So can you share uh, with me the coolest memory that you have about being a, a sports team optometrist? Um, well, you get um, hugs from very famous people um, when they come off their field and they're all sweated up. They say, oh, Doc, how are you? And they give you this big <laughs> hug and they're just dripping in sweat. Um, probably the, the um, thing I remember the most about um, these major league, uh, dealing with major league players has to do with the, um, you have to be adaptable because when you walk into a training camp, especially in a new place that you've never been to before, they'll say, well, we have this room over here. Is this where you'd like to work? And it's an, it's an eight by eight room. And they said, well, I really need a 20 foot throw and da, 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 da. <laughs> And we've had some very interesting, um, you have to be very inventive. There was probably the most, um, the uh, most example of having to be adaptable was the biggest room they had was the shower room. So we actually had the player sitting on the toilet looking through the stall and we set up a piece of wood on the sink and we put our visual acuity target there and that was the <laughs> longest throw that the, that the team could give us. Oh my goodness. Now when we've been there for a while and we then go back to the this is same probably place. The beginning. It was very okay. at the beginning, that's correct. So you have to be, you have to walk in, you have to look around, you have to say what pieces of equipment do I have, what's yeah. the, what's the uh, viewing distance have to be and then look around and see what will. Uh, we once were in a, a room that the diagonal was long enough, but the straight throw was not. So we had one player sitting in one room looking at the, the, uh, the chart on the other side uh -huh. and one sitting on the other corner. So their, their visual <laughs> pathways were crossing one another. In the corners. But in the corners, but that's what we had to do to be able yeah. to get the, the distances that we needed. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's so it's a lot of, a lot of good memories. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so do you still, um, I'm sure they remember you and if you saw them, they would probably say hi, right? Um, yes, yeah. uh, many of the players uh, know you and we've worked with some of them more than just at a screening level. Mm -hmm. um, and they're very thankful for the work that you've been able to do for them. Very gratifying. Very cool, yeah, I love that. Um, so let's see. So I think we actually went through a lot of these questions. Um, and so can you explain um, 
sports vision consultant. Is that kind of what you were talking about, where you have a different, it's not a comprehensive eye exam, but a very specialized right. exam? Yes, the, when we say sports vision consultant, that really uh, has to do with rather than individuals, because in an individual level, you're their, you're their doctor. You may end up doing both a comprehensive exam and a sports vision evaluation. But when you do consulting, you go to a team that has a particular issue, mm -hmm. a particular problem, and you can design your services for them for what you need to solve their problem. Got it. So you consult for an organization, you provide vision care for individual patients. Okay. So you work with uh, one team at a time, you're telling me about that spring training. But we have eight major league teams that we deal with right now, okay. um, and more clamoring to get in the door. But uh, so last year we left uh, our practices on February 20th and we walked back in on April 1st. We were gone for six weeks because it's a hard deadline on April 1st. You've got to be done by that time. And all the teams want you to do the things earlier and earlier because that right. way the players can take advantage of any treatment that you have during spring training. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of players that are trying to make the team. Mm -hmm. So they have a 40-man roster that they start with uh, when, the, when the major guys and all the invitees show up in camp. And by the April 1st, it has to be down to 25. Mm -hmm. So that's... Uh, it's a big job, and, and they're not um, drafting or contracting players based purely on vision. It's another piece of the puzzle right. about whether this person will be the best person for the team. So we provide that vision input uh, to the team that they can use in their mix of reasons for uh, hiring a player. That's, that's actually really crucial and cool. <music> Um, what would you tell uh, an optometrist who wants to get involved in sports vision? You were kind of touching on that you only need, you already have everything you need for uh, the exam, but um, any words of encouragement or wisdom or pearls? I think I would start locally. I would look at the high school level, I look at the junior college level, I look at uh, the, um, at a college level team. Um, if you happen to have one of those in your city, well, we're lucky here in Fullerton. We have a Division I team at Cal State Fullerton. Um, because, quite frankly, uh, working with professional teams is difficult. Um, and it's very difficult to break in to that um, at this point because most teams already have, you know, vision consultants that they deal with. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to develop some expertise and you have to develop some experience. Mm -hmm. And the best way to do that is at a uh, high school or a college level. Um, and you need to, um, number one, know what you're doing. It'd be probably the easiest to, to get a mentor. Mm -hmm. In other words, uh, volunteer for the Special Olympics uh, when the call comes out for volunteers for that. So you can begin to deal with athletes and, and begin to rub shoulders with other doctors that are involved in sports vision mm -hmm. and learn from them. And then you're going to have to go to make a presentation to the athletic director mm -hmm. of whatever school you're, uh, you're at um, and explain to them the importance of vision. And probably one thing I would caution anybody about in this field is never relate what you do to performance on the field. In other words, if you do this, you're mm -hmm. going to hit 400. Mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. It's not, one, it's not that simple. Mm -hmm. And number two, if they don't hit 400, then what's sure. the problem? Yeah. Is it your fault? Yeah. So all you want to do is keep, keep the word in mind of optimization. Mm -hmm. You want to optimize the visual system so it is not what's holding you back mm -hmm. from performing optimally. I mean, if you have 20 over 8 vision yeah. and you've got great contrast and you you can process visual information very quickly and you have a limp, you're not going to make it. Right. Okay, so there are other factors involved, not just vision, but certainly vision is a, an important component and you don't want their ability to perform to be inhibited right. by a vision problem that's potentially correctable. Right. And vision is such a big part of everything, right? I've it's never seen process. a batter walk up to the plate and close their eyes. Yeah. <laughs> so we know that vision is certainly right. uh, related to performance. Yeah. Um, so if somebody wanted to learn about how to do all of the, <clears throat> the programs for a sports vision, 
I don't remember there being a specific course in school just for sports vision. Again, it was tied to but vision therapy. Um, did you learn everything uh, from experience and you just kind of curated your own, your own program? Um, I would say that's pretty much true. There is a book by Graham um, Erickson mm -hmm. on sports vision, mm -hmm. uh, which outlines many of the uh, many of the components of a sports vision exam. Mm -hmm. uh, there's the sports vision section of the uh, American Optometric Association, where you can rub shoulders with people that uh, uh, do a lot of sports vision, mm -hmm. um, and there are uh, articles uh, that you can read. Um, about starting a sports vision practice. I don't remember when I wrote a two-part series for one of the journals. I don't remember which one it was, I mean. quite frankly. <laughs> but it's, the, it's certainly there for that's searchable. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of uh, information uh, out there. And if you look up uh, either uh, Kirshen or you look up Labby, you'll get the most recent scientific information having to do with sports vision. You should just put it all together into one book and publish it. I think that would be helpful. Well, maybe when you finish this video series, you can start on a book series and we can talk about a book contract. Yeah. That'd that be great. <laughs> that sounds interesting. Um, and then, so kind of tying into that actually, what is uh, the best business or optometry book uh, that you've read that really just helped with kind of, you know, overall, your practice here, your sports vision just kind of stuck with you and you still remember it? Well, this was many years ago. Um, Borish has the most comprehensive book on clinical practice of optometry, Irving Borish. Mm -hmm. um, and going even further back than that, Sir Stuart Duke Elder uh, has a series that's much more related to ophthalmology than it is to optometry, but there are some sections of his, um, I don't know, there must be 15 or 20 books by Sir Stuart Duke Elder uh, having to do with vision, but that's all dated information because that was a long time ago. So, and I'd, I'd also yeah. put in a plug for the American Academy of Optometry. It probably has the um, single best CE um, that people can get in various fields, including sports vision. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. That's actually, uh, I didn't know that they, I heard of um, them having CEs, but is it, you're talking about uh, in person, like a workshop, or are you talking about online? Yeah. They have both. They, oh, okay. have a, um, they have a big vision meeting every year. It's in October or November. We just came back from San Antonio. And they have research papers, and they have posters, and they have workshops. Uh, they actually had a workshop on sports vision this year. What is iCheck Systems? Is that the system that you're talking about? iCheck Systems is a company founded by Dr. Labby and I that we do all of our sports vision work with. Oh, okay, okay, got it. I, I was wondering if it was a software. I'm um, no. just kind of curious. Um, and then um, last uh, question I have. Any optometrists that you want me to interview so you can learn more about them? Anyone that comes to mind? Probably the best practice management um, doctor I know is probably um, Mark Wright out of Ohio State. He and his wife um, have a very successful practice in, uh, in fact, he's the editor of Business and Optometry. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a really smart guy. Mm -hmm. And if somebody wants to know how to successfully start a private practice, he it's would. Like uh, he and his wife would be somebody to interview, and of course, Dr. Larsable, who is local, mm -hmm. uh, has a lot of practice management experience as well. Yeah, definitely. Well, thank you so much for your time. It was a pleasure, and it was really fun learning. Uh, I've never heard of sports vision before to this extent, so thank you so much for shedding that light to me. Um, and also, if you guys have any other questions or further uh, inquiries, you guys can go ahead and email me, and then I'll pass along any questions that you guys might have uh, to Dr. Christian. Thank you.